Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here representing uh, Carmelo uh, Bonanella, and he actually led this work and uh, because some uh, health issues, he, it's not possible for him to present today. And sorry about the delay because I, I lost the access to the presentation, so I was <laughs> just uh, checking with him to uh, send to me again. And so, uh, so the title of the presentation, basically, uh, we will show how we did this work uh, to predict uh, the, f the future of the Earth under uh, different climate scenarios. So uh, I will explain like uh, the whole process, how we did, what is the background, and in the end, and uh, the last part of the presentation, I will uh, show also the maps and how they look like and explore a bit the data. So uh, we have a bit less than 45 minutes now, but uh, I will show also how to access it and and we can discuss and have some questions. So as it's for the first part, it's only me. I think if you have any question, just raise your hand and we can uh, talk immediately. I think this way it's better. And so we don't lose time. So basically why we did this uh, work. So because of course, climate change, it's a big issue. So we have several, like it's a global effort really to try to mitigate the climate change effects. And we need to have like really uh, information to anticipate that, and and do it like so. There are different ways to generate like data and information about it, but in general, so we kind of um, if you think about like spatial predictions and uh, kind of gridded data, we have some data sets, and there are different ways to generate that. But in this effort, the idea was really uh, try to produce it and to increase this. Uh, type of uh, uh, predictions for the future, but using a kind of data-driven approach. So that's kind of one of the main contributions of the, the work. And I will show exactly how we did that. And of course, doing that, we believe that it's, uh, we are contributing to uh, uh, provide more information, both in space and in time. And of course, uh, to do that, we match it with the intergovernmental inter panel of climate change defined it for the climate change scenarios. So basically they published this um, report a while ago. So they also, it's, this is the kind of the 50 assessment that they did. So they basically established some uh, representative concentration pathways. So this is kind of very well known for uh, who works with uh, environmental data. And in this, uh, like, Scenarios they basically uh, modeled and predict how uh, would be the impact in, in Earth if it, the global warming just keeping uh, really increasing and and so and they model it considering also of course multiple other aspects but here for example I'm just showing the uh, what would be the global surface um, temperature like the average of the Earth so considering these three different scenarios so basically when you increase uh, the number. It's basically like a kind of worse scenario where we have like more, uh, a higher average for the uh, temperature uh, of, the, of the earth. And you can see that there also, of course, some prediction interval for what they did. So, but, and of course, this also has impacts in uh, emissions of uh, green uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and things like that. And they did that for, Kind of different um, uh, period, but the, and and when you go like to the end of the of the projected um, scenario, it's basically two hundred uh, two thousand and hundred. So uh, it seems to be like really far, but um, I will show you that we have some uh, results like for more recent years that we need to really uh, pay attention and analyze it. So here are some uh, examples of um, so how would be the average of the surface temperature. So and uh, you can see like some difference like from the the kind of reference period and what would be like uh, how the Earth would look like for example uh, with this increasing temperature. So this is as I said it's kind of very well known and that's 
actually the, the, the really the background for the work that we developed here. So, and of course, if you, everything is interconnected. So if we have this uh, increase in surface uh, temperature, of course, it will impact also precipitation regimes and the precipitation regimes will impact, for example, vegetation and, and, and things like that. So it's really uh, actually difficult to model and to predict uh, these impacts. And of course, there are several uh, organizations and projects doing uh, this type of work and trying to understand what would be the impacts. Uh, so on the other hand, if uh, we think about kind of natural vegetation, right? So uh, we have this uh, classification defined by International Union of Conservation of Nature. And basically here they consider like biogeographical unity consisting in a community of uh, that, that uh, formed in, res in response to one of or few major ecological drives and regulate ecological functions. So uh, we have this kind of biomes classification uh, that really analyze uh, the vegetation, but also other uh, aspects of the landscape and, and, and create this, this kind of different uh, classes. So in here are uh, the main biomes. So we have the tropical and subtropical forest and temperate and boreal forest, a shrubland, woodland biome. So every biome has uh, your own characteristics, but of course it's, it's a whole uh, ecosystem. And also savanna and grasslands, and deserts and semi-deserts and, and polar and, and alpine biomes. So basically that's a kind of very broad classification of, of biomes. Uh, and if you if you think about like uh, the the goal of the the, the work, the major um, uh, uh, question here is what would be the impacts in these biomes, right? So it's a way to kind of classify the environment and considering these uh, the impacts of the climate change, how they would uh, be like uh, it would be if if there would be some transitions or I don't know forests would become savanna or something like that. So and of course not only what happened, but where would happen, right? So, and, and with, with magnitude. So, because we, we can have different, like we also have different climate change scenarios. So that was a kind of the, the background of the work. To really operationalize it, uh, we, we tested like a kind of pure data driven approach. I will uh, explain it in, in detail. And to be able to uh, really model it, uh, so basically, the idea it's really do uh, the main goal here would be like do predictions for how the biomes would look like considering the different uh, climate change scenarios and to uh, be able to do that we use this uh, kind of very nice uh, biome data set so it's basically almost 9000 of observations indicating pollen and fossil reconstruction for ecosystem dated from uh, 6000 years ago so the idea of this data set, it's actually, it's a kind of uh, ground truth. I know that we had some discussions uh, about the terminology here, but this is like really like high quality data set that was collected for different initiatives. And you can see they are kind of uh, spread all over the world. There are some clusters also. And we also uh, expanded these, uh, these points with some pseudo points that we, uh, added, for example, in Brazil, where, where we didn't have like this data set available. So if you want to know more about the reference data, and so Tom uh, Engel et al. published uh, a paper uh, a few years ago, so where all the preparation for the training data was uh, is explained. I will show what, uh, what he produced in this work. Uh, but also it's really important to say that we also put all this training data available. So for example, if you want to use for a, maybe a different effort or different modeling you can use. And so it's free and, and open. So I will show how to access it. So, and considering the, the, this data set, we have like several classes like uh, cold deciduous forests and, and they have like, it's, it's quite imbalanced because this is actually like data that was collected across um, several studies. So there is no like uh, some data set that we just 
kind of designed the, some, some sampling uh, strategy in advance. It's just something that we kind of use it what uh, is there to, to try to do modeling. And of course, it creates several uh, challenges uh, because of course the data was not specifically designed for, for modeling. But it's high quality data set as it's really something that uh, represents like uh, years and uh, thousands of years. So, and here you have all this class. So tropical savanna, uh, temperate, deciduous, uh, broadleaf forest, steppe, and some points are really like low amount, or, or, or like around like 100. Other points are more, uh, almost uh, 1,000. So, and basically what uh, Tom did in this work, he basically used this point to train a, a data-driven approach, a machine learning approach to predict and produce uh, like a map of how these biomes would look like. So, and he also aggregated the class in some way. So for example, we have this data, uh, the, the map, we have it available here. You can see also the points. So here you can see all the, uh, I think it's actually all the classes. I'm not sure if he did some aggregation uh, in the publication but maybe for some classes that are uh, really similar. So this is what, uh, so it's kind of uh, a representation of, of the earth uh, without uh, uh, people basically, without human influence. So basically he used it mostly like natural uh, covariates like climate, terrain, so and he used this training data that uh, was representing uh, like the earth uh, over the uh, past uh, thousand years and to really produce how this would look like. So for example, if we click here, I can see that, okay, there is no, uh, this is tropical savanna, right? And so there are other data sets here, I will not explain it. So I think Tom also mentioned it, uh, the open land map uh, yesterday. But this platform, it's where we are hosting most of the global data sets that OpenGeoHub is producing. So, and this is the, the data set derived by that uh, paper. So here is the, uh, it, we call like potential uh, distribution of biomes. And you can really see, for example, for, in Brazil. So of course, I'm going directly to Brazil because that's an area where I can uh, explain a bit more. And, so here you have really like where the savanna uh, kind of ends. You have this transition zone. Uh, here it's kind of tropical same evergreen broadleaf forest. And uh, after that here it's actually uh, tropical evergreen broadleaf forest. So, and that's, that is really interesting because for example, this kind of division here, it's, it's also some, it's used by the country as a kind of uh, geo, uh, political division of biomes. So they also use it, this, uh, not based on this map, but it's, it's really matching with I see uh, there. So, and of course we have it for all the world. And for example, we can go here in Italy to see how it, it was classified. So temperate deciduous broadleaf forest. And so that was a kind of effort to uh, do it through machine learning. So instead to, I don't know, do it by kind of expert based, we just use the points as reference and we train it like a model considering different variables like climate, precipitation, terrain, and we predict and produce this kind of uh, output. So it's uh, fully reproducible, right? You can, if you use the same points, the same covariates, you should be able to reproduce it. And it's quite um, uh, objective, right? So you don't have like, some threshold decision, I should define like forests is we have some um, certain amount of precipitation or, or something like that. So, okay, so on top of this work, uh, what we did, basically we took all these points and we kind of matched it with the biomes uh, definition uh, from, from U -E -E -U -C -N class. So basically this, that six, like broad definitions of biomes. So, and this is basically a lookup table. So when we did that, 
I was, for example, checking with Carmelo before the presentation. So uh, I remember also in the review process, there was no complaint about it. So it was a kind of quite straightforward. So um, uh, because it, it was a kind of, uh, uh, it was kind of easy to match. Uh, but of course, here we, we just used what we had to uh, uh, do this uh, lookup table. So, okay, so using this data as reference, we uh, need to train a model and we need to predict the future, right? So, and, but most of the machine learning approach that we do, like for classify land cover, tree species, soil, basically we look to the past. So basically we take several data sets that are available, might be some archive of Sentinel, Landsat, and we just um, do some kind of feature engineering. We prepare the data, we do the training and we classify the past. But when you need to classify the future, of course, uh, you need to have some future predictions. So what we did, we relied on this um, uh, work developed by Chelsea, and basically they produced uh, 17 bioclimatic variables, uh, considering monthly temperature and rainfall values, and also 64 climate variables, considering temperature, also precipitation, so long term. Uh, but what they also did, they have this to the past at one kilometer. So we use all, all the, this is a kind of our uh, reference data for climate uh, at Open GeoHub. We use it, this for several uh, models uh, to predict, for example, the past, to predict like land cover, or we also considering the climate or tree species. Uh, but to predict the future, of course, we need to have future predictions. And what they did, basically they also predict what would be the, uh, how these variables would look like considering the scenarios defined uh, by the, 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 the climate change scenarios, basically. So uh, that was a kind of the perfect input for us because we could, in this way, we basically train in a model in the past and considering what they projected in the future, of course, they are modeling it, right? So, and their model also has some limitations. But uh, using these uh, future predictions, we basically could extrapolate we extrapolated our model in the future. So how the biomes would look like. So, and, and doing this way, it's a kind, quite nice exercise because we basically, we put some uh, concrete meaning, right? So if you just say, okay, the temperature will change, what will happen? So here we are trying to model what will be the impact in the natural vegetations and, uh, and in this biome environment. So in the biome here, it's basically the, um, a unit analysis that we are using. So if you think about these 17 bioclimatic variables, it's basically, for example, annual precipitation, temperature, seasonality, and mean temperature of the wetness quarter. So they do a lot of this analysis at one kilometer. And it's, uh, as I said, it's quite useful because it's one kilometer. So it's kind of, there are still some challenges to match it with for example, 30 meter, 100 meter of resolution, other data sets, but uh, we basically do it through a kind of downscaling approach. So, and basically we use all these climate variables, it kind of composed our feature space, and we, uh, we use it also like six topographic variables. So slope, aspect, uh, terrain, and derivatives. And these were computed in 250 meter resolution. And basically these kind of two groups uh, uh, combined uh, represents the feature space that we classified. Of course, we, the terrain is quite stable, so we don't have like future projections for the terrain. It's, it, it doesn't make sense. But for the uh, climate, uh, it makes sense. And, and we are relying on what Chelsea produced and to do this classification. So I will explain the, the methods and open them the mess, but we, the work is published. So we produce it, uh, predictions for all the biome, uh, the, the, the seven biomes uh, uh, class, but also, also for the EUCN class, like this broad biome definition. I will open the map and show to you. But we are also, uh, we also produce uh, the probability. So, for example, maybe if you are interested in a specific biome, you can go, for example, maybe you are working with savanna, 
and you can go and check only the probability of savanna and you could derive some analysis on, on top of that instead to work, for example, only with the hard class uh, map. Uh, and so when we derived the probabilities for, uh, and also the uncertainty of the probability, it's basically what Martin was uh, presenting. We, we have some clash of, uh, that we should, shouldn't call uncertainty, uh, so it's more like a model deviance, but um, we, we are working to really uh, find a kind of reliable method to predict uh, uncertainty. And, and here it's more like a kind of uh, model deviance because it, as we have a probability, this uncertainty is basically kind of the standard deviation of multiple models that we predicted the probability. So you can assume a kind of, you can generate some interval, but statistically there are some problems with that. So on the other hand, uh, Carmelo also computed this margin of uh, victor. So when you have this, uh, this hard class map, uh, this is a kind of uh, usual metric for, for this case, it's, it, it, it might be really more related with the uncertainty because the margin of victory is basically how the two classes, like what is the difference between the first, the, the class with the highest probability and the second one. So maybe you have a pixel where it's classified in the final map, I don't know, as forest, but the probability of savanna, like the second highest probability, it's really close. So it was kind of almost by chance that the pixel was labeled uh, in the end as, uh, as forest for the classifier. So I will show what we can do with that and, and how, for example, Carmelo organized the, the results. So of course, so you can access the paper here. I will not open most of the figures I, uh, I'm using for the uh, presentation, but it's important also to say that we put everything in the Zenodo. So uh, the layers are documented here and we also put like, it's, it's a bit like a nice also, it's, it's really nice actually when you download the data, you'll have the legends and things like that. You don't need to worry and even like to match the color. So Carmelo did that, uh, organized the, the legends for uh, the Quant GIS project. You have all the probabilities here. So you can download and start using. So this is kind of, uh, this is one kilometer product and and yeah, everything gets available. So, and specifically what we did, um, so we built this kind of uh, feature space considering the climate data and for the modeling, it was considering past data. So uh, the reference period, I think it's some point in 80s to 2018, uh, if, I'm, if, if I'm not wrong. So, but it's basically like past climate data plus the rain. And, and we use the biome points as training uh, reference and we apply the kind of our uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, machine learning pipeline. So we did the hyperparameter tuning, we selected the best features and we applied, uh, and in this case it was an ensemble model. So we test, we trained with three models and we had the kind of meta learner that combines the results of this real models and we predicted the, the, the maps, but of course we, we also evaluated the model performance through cross-validation and there is also some feature importance analysis. So uh, in a more technical side, uh, we do at OpenGeoHub everything, uh, not everything, but 80% of the uh, products that we are uh, producing, basically we do in-house. We have some connection with clouds that we used to download and move the data to our environment so we have more flexibility and to uh, make uh, all these pipeline runs. Basically, we uh, split uh, the region of interesting tiles. So here is the whole world uh, split into 23,000 tiles and we predict every tile separately and later we aggregate that and we uh, produce cogs and uh, cloud optimized geotiffs and we put it available, for example, in Zenodo, in the stack catalog, web viewers as we have for the open land map. So, but we uh, also, we also, it, the data, it's, it's nice, you can put the data available, but we also invest a lot in document all these steps. 
So even for example, for us, it's really important because uh, during the review process, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Carmelo uh, executed it like several times. So and when you document all the processing steps and you kind of autom you, you produce like a scripts to make it everything automatically, uh, it's easy to, to kind of recompute and fix, for example, some issues. And of course, in the end, we make the whole pipeline available. So for this paper specifically, uh, we created this uh, GitLab, uh, GitHub repository. And here, for example, uh, you have some information general about the paper. Of course, the technical description of the work is really in the paper. But for example, Carmelo did everything in R, so you can really see how they did the prediction and how the modeling work. So, and in this case, all the functions are here. So uh, you can see the results of the variable importance. So sometimes you have some parts that are kind of comment that he tested and probably something that didn't work. So, and on top of that, we also try to build, for example, like really packages. So for example, that's what we are doing with the scikit-map. And the scikit-map, it's like more in, in Python. But the idea here is really like make everything open, right? So the reference data, the reference data we also use to do validation, but we need to execute that in a kind of specific way. So we make the code available, we make data available, and we try to put like even in different uh, host uh, solutions. So we put in Zenodo, but we also put in another platform where people can visualize the data easily or open directly in the QuantJS. And of course, doing that, we truly believe that we can um, boost the access and, and, and promote like, uh, like uh, more, uh, uh, like spread better the, the, the information and also help uh, to create the, like the community in general. So, and of course, doing that, we are uh, really pursuing a kind of fully uh, reproducible uh, who, like science in general. So, and this is, so when you think about reproducibility, we have this whole spectrum. So even, for example, uh, in this paper specifically, they said that even if you just put the code available, it's, it's, it's already like, a, like one step further than just have a publication, right? So, uh, but this is only the first step. You need to provide the code, you need to provide the data. Sometimes you, you are working with massive amount of data and it's a bit tricky and difficult to make it um, available. So that's why, for example, we have uh, like other platforms and for example, OpenEO, it's, it's really uh, trying to uh, push on this direction. So where we can really uh, run like a pipeline there, you have the data there and you, you have a backend defined. And if you execute uh, the same analysis, uh, you should receive the same results. And, and also, uh, you have documentation around it. Uh, you need to link with some ex 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 executable codes. So, and for us at least at Topic GeoHub, we always try to put everything as cloud optimized and analysis ready so people can easily access it uh, in the, directly to the internet. We try to put it in a stack uh, following uh, the open catalogs. We try to create no, no, uh, computational notebooks and also like software libraries. So uh, really to uh, pursuing this uh, fully reproducible science. Okay, back into the results. What uh, Carmelo did here, it's basically, uh, we have about these 9,000 samples uh, classified in, in these um, uh, several classes basically. And we did a repeated, uh, five-fold spatial cross-validation. It means that for uh, every 20% uh, of this data, we kind of remove it and we predict it with 80% and, and we really match it. The, we did that in a way that to avoid this spatial correlation. So if you have like a big cluster of points, for example, I don't know, in some place in Europe, we don't use that cluster uh, like to validate and to train at the same time. So that's why we invest a lot in uh, this cross-validation, based in this spatial cross-validation, because when you think about it, uh, if you have like a kind of 
design based sampling so if you just think about the sam the sampling strategy before and you go to collect the data you it, it's fine some some uh, works do that so mostly for land cover that's what they do so they uh, select like the points and they label the points and later they put this together but they have a kind of full control of the how the data will be collected and things like that but uh, you cannot do it for some uh, different uh, variables so in this case these points were kind of bottom up right they were collected before and we have they we are limited with the data availability that we have here uh, so we need to have some kind of strategies to uh, deal with that. And so in here there, it's the cross validation that we did. And we basically use these three metrics. So the F1 score, some classes are uh, kind of low in the F1 score. So we have different um, uh, number of observations. But as we also predicted the probability, we did this kind of log loss metric. So this is a kind of uh, occurrence metric that works in the probability space, comparing, for example, the results of a specific model with a kind of baseline or dummy model that predicts uh, kind of the same uh, value. So we can see uh, what is the, the, the impact of uh, in the added value of the probabilities. So here are the mapping results. So this map, it's exactly uh, follow exactly what I was showing the open land map. This is a kind of improved version of what Don did in 2018. And of course, he, he was also uh, behind of this work. So we use it better covariates, better methods, and, and we uh, improve it, the quality of that work. And, and here it's the margin of victory. So uh, we can see, for example, where we have, uh, I personally, Think that this legend it should be the other way around but here in blue you can see that uh, where you have really big difference uh, in in the uh, probability considering the the, the uh, actually it's it's right the difference here is if you have like a small difference you have more uncertainty and if you have like a higher value here it means that the probability it's almost like the majority so blue it's good <laughs> so uh, and basically, if you think about this, uh, okay, I don't know why. Let me just back here, remove this. Yeah, here, so we can read that. So, and basically, if you think about this margin of victor, uh, victory, we can really use that to uh, understand where you have more. Uh, accurate predictions but in the space right it's not just okay this is a number so i have f1 score equals something so and basically that's what uh, carmelo did here so i will show the uh, transitions uh, across uh, the biomes and how it will looks like but uh, we trained it in the past data with this uh, past climate data and we predicted in the future considering the scenarios i will go to the other slides to show how it looks like but here for example we have all these uh, three here it was actually three scenarios and and using these uh, scenarios we can uh, really see for example where the 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 margin of victory is higher and where there is some change right so and if you have like a high mar margin of victory as we see here in the in red uh, probably we should pay attention in these regions. So we can see here, for example, that there is some transition of biomes here. Not all the biomes change it. Of course, the whole earth will not change because of the, the, this uh, increase in temperature. But there are some key hotspots that we need to be aware. Of, and that's exactly what we are seeing here in these maps. It's where these transitions across biomes are occurring according to our predictions in the future. So in the red, it's really where we have like a high uh, certainty considering the, the the output of the model and yellow it's like when we have like a kind of uh, more uh, less margin of victory it means that the probabilities are uh, more close so might not really have a change but the red it's something that we should really pay attention so and if you think about the three uh, scenarios that we predict 
So basically here, uh, when you go to the right, it's basically the, the, the temperature is increasing, right? So you have like a more uh, impact. And, and here it's really the transitions. So uh, we had like 27% uh, uh, here uh, in this scenario of the tropical sub uh, tropical forest biome that will uh, be uh, converted, for example, to uh, shrubland and shrub woodland biomes. So, and if we check the map, we can really trace back and see where these areas uh, are uh, happening. And for example, in the most extreme scenario, so these uh, forest areas will basically be transformed in savanna and, and grassland biomes. So these analysis uh, were like done only by the transitions. So of course, it, it doesn't represent all the forest, but it's a kind of relative analysis considering the areas that are changing in the um, future years uh, if this, the temperature uh, keeps increasing. So we saw it in different, uh, so we analyzed it also in other papers. So some, uh, of course, there are other publications that are also doing it. But as far as, as we know, so this work, it's, it's in a kind of uh, uh, at global scale. It's uh, kind of the pioneer in this area. And again, we, here it's a data-driven approach. So we have a model that predicts, so we, we are not using any kind of threshold to define when the biome will appear or not, or it will change. Uh, we, we really, uh, we are using this reference data to train like a, a model. So and now Carmelo is working specifically to improve the uh, high resolution um, distribution maps for tree forest, so 16, forest tree species uh, from 2000 and also the maps will be available here. So this is more like to say that if you really want to, if you are really interested in, in uh, forest tree species or so Carmelo, it's the uh, person that you should talk uh, at Open GeoHub. So I will quickly show the results. So and I Thing. Just a second, I will, I have it here. So this is not like a big data set. So I kind of have the uh, data here in my uh, computer. So, and let me zoom in. So basically this is a, a prediction from uh, 2040 to 2060, right? So that's the kind of the first scenario. And we can compare with the baseline. So basically, that's what would, will happen here in the Amazon border. So that's the current prediction. So and we, we didn't predict only in this class. We kind of, Carmelo also, as far as, as I remember, so he, he really predicted uh, in this class. So this is a kind of the, uh, the kind of the sub levels. And this is the biome uh, 6000 legend and he aggregated uh, further to this uh, map. So here it's actually that uh, biomes uh, groups. And so this is what, this is the, what will happen here in this scenario. And if you keep going further with the uh, increase of temperature, you can really see the, the big difference, right? So this is really like 80, I think, yeah. No? Oh, this is terrible, so I cannot yeah. see. 85, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, let's go to another place. So we can see what will happen like here. Uh, and basically, yeah, so, and that's the difference. So we, we of course, we analyzed the data in, <coughs> The first times that we executed, we, we found like some nonsensical results in the Sahara, for example. And this is, this is again, it's something that we are predicting for the future, right? So all the validation that we did is only in a model modeling aspect. So we validated the performance of the model to predict the past. And here we are extrapolating to the future uh, predictions of precipitation and, and things like that. So. Uh, 
and here, for example, it's the it's different uh, scenarios, and this is from yeah. And here you have a different time frame. Uh, let me see if I can enable it. So because the data that Chelsea produced, it's basically like future climate predictions for different scenarios and from different uh, time periods. So they modeled you uh, 2040, 2060, and 2080, if I'm not wrong. And here it's really like, uh, like further in time, but also uh, further in the, uh, in the increase of the temperature. So, and okay, so that's actually uh, all that I have to, that I have to show. And yeah, I'm open to questions. A question. Um, yeah, thanks. Is uh, this so? If I understood well, then all of what that you show here doesn't take account uh, any anthropogenic uh, action like deforestation, removing space for no. culture. So this, this should is... be added to this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a kind of the just the temperature the change. The scenario. Scenario. Okay. Yeah. You are right. Yeah, that's a very good point because the modeling actually only considered the 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 terrain and the uh, future projections of the climate. So I'm I'm not sure how they predicted the climate. So the temperature maybe they incorporate some um, anthropogenic aspect, but in the, in our modeling we are just looking what would be the f the future for the the increase in temperature and, and precipitation. So for example, for sure deforestation here, I, I don't think uh, I'm almost sure that it's not included. So if it keeps happening, might get worse. Um, yeah, I have a question about the extrapolation problem. Uh, is there a way to kind of have a measure of the, let's say, how much is extrapolating the model, like a distance from the data space, basically, of the or the training data studies, basically. Yeah, that that's a good question. So that's one actually one of the questions of the reviewers. I remember. So there is this um, area of applicability. So Edzer and uh, Hannah Meyer, they are kind of work on that. Hannah has a kind of has a package to do it in R. We actually we try to execute, but it's even for this data set that it's not really massive. It's quite uh, computational because. As far as I understood, basically you create kind of some, you use the feature space and we, you define a kind of where your model, it's kind of predicting considering distance in the feature space. And when you do extrapolation, you basically calculate the distance uh, in, in this feature space, like considering the samples that you have. But uh, at, at least like to run for this analysis, it, it was really computational. We tested and there was, uh, no way to do it like at global scale, even if it's one kilometer, it's not massive. But uh, methodological, there are some uh, alternatives. I think now it's more a, a, a matter of really to make it more operational to scale with the amount of data. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I'm finished. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much and if you have more interest, please contact Carmelo. I'm just here representing here. <laughs>